Business Continuity and Disaster Recovery Solution. That would be better. The HCP <laughs> webinar series is sponsored by Continuity Housing, which guarantees pre-negotiated hotel rooms at substantial savings for the critical employees of larger and mid-sized companies in order to pre help prevent a business disruption in the event of a crisis. They've created a patent-pending guaranteed employee housing program, which ensures, which secures and protects hotel rooms for critical personnel and their families if needed, while saving companies significant expense. Continuity Housing has a 100% success record with their deployments, and each member of their team has at least 10 years of experience. If you'd like information on receiving a 30-minute analysis of your current housing plan or a strategy session about how to create a housing plan, visit continuityhousing.com or leave a comment in the survey that will pop up at the end of the webinar. This and all ACP webinar series webinars are recorded and available on the Continuity Housing YouTube channel and in the members area of the ACP website. Please feel free to share the link to the recordings with your peers and anyone that you think would be interested. You'll receive a link to the recording after the webinar via email along with the slide deck used in today's presentation. Speaking of the presentation, when most organizations develop their business continuity and disaster recovery uh, programs, they only consider using uh, that solution during a disaster. But as New Hampshire-based Service Credit Union demonstrates, taking a different approach can help you get the most value out of your solution. Service Credit Union has a mobile banking unit on retainer with Rensis uh, Recovery Services and has implemented it not only for a disaster-related event, but also for accommodating business operations during a period of growth. Join us to learn how, like Service Credit Union, you can get the greatest return on investment from your business continuity and disaster recovery solution. Our speakers today, uh, we're fortunate to have Dave Tedford, uh, National Sales Manager with Rensis uh, Recovery Services. Dave has been working in the business continuity and disaster recovery space for over 20 years and has been with Rensis since 2006. He's also the president of the Greater Boston ACP chapter. And Bill Arnold, a CIO of Service Credit Union, uh, has more than 20 years of technology experience. As CIO at Service CU, he directs a staff of 15 and is responsible for technology delivery at 34 locations in New Hampshire, Massachusetts, and Germany. Please join me in welcoming Bill Arnold and Dave Tedford. Thank you, Ed. Almost gave me a heart attack. I thought I had to put on my Bo Mitchell hat for a second there. Welcome, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. To get started, I wanted to give you a very brief overview of Rensis. As this slide illustrates, Rensis Recovery Services is a nationwide provider of business continuity and disaster recovery solutions. Rensis has business recovery centers and mobile deployment locations in the following areas. Rensis is a wholly owned subsidiary of Reynolds and Reynolds, who is a privately held multi-billion dollar organization. This next slide illustrates the Rensis Wheel of Services. As you can see, Rensis provides many types of disaster recovery and business continuity services. The Rensis portfolio services can be described as a 10-point program. At a high level, Rensis provides solutions to help companies protect and recover their mission-critical assets, their people, and their systems. So when it comes to protecting those assets, Rensis can provide point number one, infrastructure as a service, software as a service, managed cloud, hosting solutions. So depending on what level of the production server OS stack you want to manage, or you want us to manage, we can provide you with that level of service and hardware. Point number two, disaster recovery as a service and co-location. If you want to own and manage the disaster recovery hardware, or you want Rensis to own and manage the disaster recovery hardware, we can provide you with that level of service and hardware. Point number three, virtual desktop interface. If you have lots of different desktop images and devices being used, we can own and manage the VDI solution for you. So when it comes to recovery, we can provide point number four, mobile recovery centers. 
These are custom designed tractor trailers that can be driven to your parking lot and configured with up to 50 seats per trailer in as little as 24 hours anywhere in the US. The mobile can also be deployed as a mobile call center, mobile banking unit, mobile data center, mobile command center, just to name a few different configurations. Point number five, business recovery centers. These are traditional brick and mortar facilities that can be pre-configured with up to 250 user seats. These facilities have full data center capabilities. Clients use these facilities for hot site, warm site, cold site, and co-location solutions. Point number six, quick ship, drop ship technology solutions. We have depots full of desktops, servers, mid-range systems, storage technology, any type of computer equipment you can think of in multiple locations or depots around the country. Clients have this equipment on contract to protect themselves from disasters. We can ship the equipment to our clients' locations in as little as four hours of a disaster anywhere in the U.S. Point number seven, communications recovery solutions. From a communications hardware perspective, we can provide Cisco phones, firewalls, routers, switches, cells, and wireless devices. Rensys works with its customers to construct hitching posts for mobile and generators. We can provide unlimited landline bandwidth as well as satellite communications equipment and bandwidth. Point number eight, voice recovery. Rensys provides the ability to redirect both outbound and more importantly, inbound voice calls. Rensys can provide the dial tone or the DIDs and the PRIs over the internet at time of disaster. And or can provide cloud-based telecom recovery solutions. Point number nine, software. The Rensys Continuity Management Software is a BIA BCP incident management software solution. We also have emergency notification software to push messages out to your employees and customers at time of disaster. Point number 10 is the people. We bring all of these services together with people. If you have a need for professional services, we can help. We have the best disaster recovery and business continuity and communications experts in the country. And that's enough about Rensys and our solutions. Today's topic is getting the most value out of your disaster recovery and business continuity plan. Well, how do you do that? By leveraging your plan for both disaster and non-disaster related events. So let's start off with a few examples. Here's an example of how to leverage a quick ship solution for a non-disaster situation. This is a client that manufactures medical devices. These devices are made overseas in Australia. The devices are then shipped to the U.S., which could take about a month. By the time the devices do reach the U.S. distribution facility, they may need to be updated with the latest software. So this client deploys their quick ship solution whereby they declare laptops to be shipped to their distribution facility. Upon receipt of the laptop, the client uses the laptops to load the latest software to the medical devices, tens of thousands of devices. The manufacturer brings in the required people to work around the clock until all of the devices have been updated with the latest software. This allows this manufacturer to meet their delivery time frame with their clients. It also enables them to avoid a capex expense of buying a bunch of laptops that they would only use a few times a year. Civil unrest. Here's an example of how to leverage an alternate site solution and a quick ship solution during civil unrest. We have all seen the riots on the news that have taken place around the US, Baltimore and Ferguson to name a couple. This particular client had offices in the hot zone where the riots were taking place in Baltimore. So they decided to redirect their employees to an alternate site to keep their employees out of harm's way. Although they had an alternate site, they did not have the computers and phones. So this client deployed their quick ship solution and had hundreds of desktops shipped to an alternate location where they set up their new offices until the civil unrest was under control. Once it was safe to return to their primary office, they returned the quick ship equipment back to Rensis. Again, 
the quick ship solution enabled this client to avoid a capex expense of buying a bunch of laptops. Water main break. Here is an example of how to avoid a, or how to leverage a mobile recovery center solution for a water main break. This client was in Las Vegas where there was a massive water main break. If you don't have water in your building, you cannot occupy the building. When the water main broke and the building was closed, this client deployed hundreds of mobile recovery center seats to their parking lot and set up the employee workspace right outside their building. The mobile recovery center comes with all of the technology they needed, the desktops, the phones, the printers, etc. And we work with the client to establish the voice and the data connectivity between the mobile and the building. This solution enabled this client to meet their RPOs and RTOs. It also minimized the stress of the employees because they are reporting to the same office location they normally report to. Once the water main was repaired, the employees could report back into the office building and the mobiles were sent back to the Rensis mobile deployment locations. Severe flooding. This is an example of a client that deployed their mobile recovery center because of flooding and the resulting water damage to their building. This is an ongoing event right, th right now in Houston. As we have all seen in the news, Texas has been getting their fair share of rain lately. This particular client had a building that was flooded from the first wave of water back in May. Their office building suffered significant water damage and is currently being renovated. So they immediately declared the mobile recovery solution to their parking lot and they expect to be working out of the mobile for several months while the building is being renovated. Once again, this client was able to continue business operations regardless of the flood by deploying the mobile recovery center solution. So at this time, I would like to turn it over to Bill Arnold, CIO at Service Credit Union, who will, who will explain how they deployed their DR solution for both disaster and non-disaster related events. Take it away, Bill. Uh, thanks a lot, David. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'd like to just give a brief uh, statement about the technical difficulties that we encountered at the beginning of our time together today. Uh, since we're all contingency people, uh, you ought to know that um, after this webinar was scheduled and uh, all the arrangements were made and published, I was called away to Florida and uh, am presenting today uh, from a car uh, and, and will make the best of it, as we do with everything that we do uh, when we live in uncertain times. Uh, I'd like to tell you a little bit about Service Credit Union. David covered a number of the different ways that their disaster uh, preparedness tools can be used. I'd like to talk to you some about what we have on contract and how we use those, in those contracted items in both disaster and non-disaster scenarios. I'd like to start by telling you a little bit about Service Credit Union. David, if you could go to that next slide. Um, Service Credit Union, if, if you're not familiar with credit unions, there's a lot of numbers on this slide that won't necessarily mean anything to you in terms of what they mean relative to other credit unions. There are around 6,500 credit unions in the United States. Uh, we're somewhere in the top 60 in terms of our number of assets. So that gives you some idea. We're sort of in the top 1% uh, in terms of the number of assets that we manage for our members. Uh, we're a full-service financial institution. We have a little over 200,000 members. Our field of membership, when you're a credit union, you have specific people that you can and, and can't serve. Uh, our field of membership is uh, all branches of the U.S. military and the Department of Defense, including their families and any other relatives that they have, and, and anyone who lives or works in the state of New Hampshire or in four towns in Massachusetts. Uh, which is kind of a weird field of membership uh, as you look at credit unions, but it's evolved over time. And we really, we really see ourselves as having a, a primary mission to uh, the armed services and the Department of Defense. We staff two 24 by 7 contact centers, uh, one in the United States in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, our headquarters, and one at our overseas headquarters in Kaiserslautern, Germany. 
um, and, and we do that simply because uh, we don't trust the redundancy of the links that connect the contact centers uh, across the ocean. And uh, so we have forever run two contact centers uh, in order to provide uh, sort of more local service because our primary footprint outside of the United States is in Germany. Uh, we have 49 branches uh, now. Um, I, we'll open four more before the end of this year. Uh, all of those will be in New Hampshire. So we have 31 in New Hampshire now. We have one in Massachusetts. We have one in North Dakota, which is one of the opportunity, you know, an opportunity that I'm going to talk about. Those two branches that are broken out as separate, the one in Massachusetts and the one in North Dakota, are going to be the subject of what we're going to talk about mostly today. And as I mentioned, we're uh, a little over $2.6 billion in assets, which places us you know, somewhere in the top 1% uh, in terms of asset size. Uh, of credit unions in the United States. Uh, David, if you could go to the next slide, please. Uh, so we we contract for really sort of one piece of what Rensis provides, and that is we have on contract um, a mobile banking center, a mobile recovery center that we have configured or we have a standard configuration for that is to be a replacement for a branch office that is in crisis. Um, that's been our, our goal with that recovery center uh, as long as we've had it uh, under contract. And um, we, we don't use some of the other services. We run some of that stuff internally. We have some other partners that we work with. But uh, in terms of our recovery for location-based services and, and to continue to provide service to our members, in locations where we have services now, we've contracted with Rensis for the mobile recovery centers. So the first thing I'd like to tell you about is a time when we used the mobile recovery center the way that it was sort of designed to be used. And so, uh, David, I think the next slide should say, uh, fire and Falmouth, not the way to start your day. Um, Falmouth, Massachusetts is uh, two and a half hours from our main headquarters. And in uh, 2013, if, or 2011, if you were to go back and look at our disaster recovery planning at that point in time, we had sort of a general disaster recovery plan for branches that included uh, an indication that in the event that there was a branch closure for some reason, we would position staff in such a way that they could direct members to use the next closest branch was sort of the first wave of our response mechanism. Um, we didn't have an individual plan for each one of our branches. And of course, the branch that we found ourselves uh, you know, having to deal with was one where we had no facility within two and a half hours of that particular location. So the members who were using that location, if it was unavailable, we couldn't just redirect them to another branch. That wasn't going to work. So we came to work on uh, Friday morning, October 28th. And David, if you'll go to the next slide, which um, should show a building on fire. Uh, this is a, when we came in on Friday morning, the 28th, we were presented with, hey, we found this on YouTube this morning. And this is a, a screen capture from a, a video that was on YouTube, which was taken with a cell phone camera, which was our branch in Falmouth, Massachusetts, on fire at 10.30 PM the night before. Um, and so the, the head of member services, uh, myself, the executive vice president, the, CIO, the CEO, we all got together. Uh, to, to talk about what we were going to do, uh, and we dispatched folks down to the branch to see what was going on. David, if we go to the next slide, you'll see what the branch looked like on uh, the 28th when our staff showed up to uh, start looking at the damage. Um, this is a picture looking up through what had been the cupola of the building, uh, which is where the fire started. There were some uh, electrical uh, items, some lighting, uh, sign lighting in that cupola uh, that shorted out. And uh, we were having um, Snowtober 
it was uh, October, but there was a snowstorm underway. Um, and uh, they actually moved Halloween that year uh, in New Hampshire and Massachusetts because there was so much snow at that particular point in time. Um, so on October 28th, we, we looked at the, at the unit. Uh, it, it was burned out from the, from the middle. And as the firefighters had dealt with the fire, of course, spraying it from outside up in an arc, uh, that uh, had all landed on the roof and had all piled into the building. If you go to the next slide, David, you'll see the inside of our branch, uh, which has uh, uh, cinders and, and ash you know, spread everywhere. Um, I didn't put the pictures in here of the melted PCs, although there were certainly some of those as well. Interestingly enough, in this particular facility, the data uh, center, basically, it, it, the data room, is downstairs in a, in a basement area and was untouched by anything to do with the fire, which was a really interesting scenario for us. So as I said, we, we met during the day to try to determine what we were going to do. And uh, David, if you go to the next slide, the disaster declaration slide, we finally decided at 7.16 p.m. that night Friday, October the 28th, to declare a disaster at the Falmouth branch. Um, and that was the time at which I called Rensis and authorized them to deploy a unit to Falmouth, Massachusetts to, uh, to recover that facility. Uh, the next slide, uh, David, shows the uh, mobile recovery unit arriving on site. It arrived on Monday morning at 9.07 a.m. So we declared on Friday night after the close of business and just after what would have been business opening on Monday, uh, the unit was there uh, from Rensis and uh, they, had, they had driven through the weekend coming out of Texas in order to deliver this unit to Falmouth, Massachusetts. Um, the next slide, I'd like to walk through sort of what the deployment timeline looks like. So they arrived on Monday, and on Monday we got power to the mobile unit, um, initially from generator that was on contract. Uh, eventually uh, we moved that over to a hitching post arrangement uh, using the power that was coming from the branch. We got data to the mobile unit, again, coming right out of uh, the, the data closet downstairs through protected conduit out to the trailer, uh, to the mobile recovery center. And we got our full network set up uh, in terms of the making sure that the routing was working and, and those pieces were in place by the end of that first day. On Tuesday, uh, our, my staff rolled uh, PCs down there, finished getting that, well, they rolled them down there on Monday. They finished getting it set up on Tuesday. And branch operations brought folks in to, uh, you know, get a cash delivery, get uh, training on how they were going to arm the branch in, uh, in interim and, and that sort of thing. And so we got operations staff oriented, tested all the units out in terms of connectivity and business operations, everything was working the way it should have been. Uh, it was late Wednesday, the 2nd of November, before we were able to get a permit from the town to open the facility, um, that was because they had to come out and inspect and make sure that it provided a sufficient clearance, you know, around all the different uh, pieces of it, that there was sufficient uh, access uh, and all that sort of thing. So they did all that, and really that was our, our longest, you know, sort of hang up, was waiting for the town to finish the permitting process, which they started on Monday when the unit arrived. On Thursday, uh, we finally put signage on the unit, and that was really a matter of getting the signage there from our sign company and getting it put on to the unit. And if you go to the next slide, David, you'll see the recovery center open for business on that Thursday at 8.30 in the morning. So really, uh, six days, uh, five to four days, four business days um, from, from the time uh, – that we, we lost business. So we lost business on Saturday when that branch would have been open, and then Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. And on Thursday, we were back open for business. And uh, so we worked out of that branch 
for uh, a period of time. And David, if you'll go to the next slide, you will. This is sort of our business resumption timeline. Uh, we stayed there until Monday, December the 12th, uh, which is the date on which Rensis came and removed the uh, mobile recovery center from service. We relocated to an adjacent uh, strip office mall or park uh, sort of arrangement, strip center, that was adjacent to where our branch was, which was primarily because we were having uh, difficulty accommodating parking and um, needed to, to free up the space where the mobile unit was in order to be able to have those parking spaces to continue to serve our members. And we used that time uh, between the beginning of November and uh, mid-December to, to re-outfit that space um, and, and get it ready to be used as a, a member service center during that time. And then uh, we operated in that facility for about five months while they uh, refurbished the original branch, uh, the permanent branch, and um, moved back in there. So all told, we really lost about four, four and a half days of, uh, of member service during the entire time that uh, we were uh, you know, working under, under duress. Um, so that's, you know, that's a, a, a pretty good example, I think, of the way it's supposed to work. Um, this is what we had planned for. This is what we had on our schedule. This is what we contracted for. Uh, we called. It was deployed. It got there. We worked it the way it was supposed to work. And, and we didn't drop the ball for our members who weren't able to do their financial uh, business anywhere else in, in the area. Um, and then we got presented a different opportunity. So David, uh, I think the next slide, uh, it should say, and, and now for something completely different. Um, and if, if you were a Monty Python fan, uh, fan you'd uh, be used to hearing about uh, now for something completely different. Uh, and the next slide, a disaster of opportunity. This is a very interesting uh, study, I think. We were given the opportunity, this is, uh, David, the next slide, the deployment of a mobile branch to Grand Forks, North Dakota. Up until very recently, Service Credit Union had operations in New England and in Germany. And, and those were our two footprints. We, we have a, a headquarters building in each of those areas, and our military presence was all in Germany, and our civilian presence um, was all in New Hampshire and, and, and Massachusetts. And so it was a sort of a bifurcated existence. Um, we were presented an opportunity, uh, David, if you'll go to the next slide about the selection announcement. Grand Forks Air Force Base in Grand Forks, North Dakota made the decision in uh, November of 2014 to award a contract for on-base financial services to service credit union. There had been an RFP process that had gone on during the 60 days prior to that where they had uh, requested bids from folks and, and we had responded to that. Uh, given the idea that we wanted to be able to branch out our service provision within the United States, and the only way for us to do that as a state chartered institution in, uh, in New Hampshire was for us to partner with military bases in the United States to be able to be our expansion uh, you know, footprint. And so from a business perspective, we really wanted to do that. November 17th, we got the news, hey, you've been selected uh, and we'd like to start to work with you. So of course, uh, that meant now it was time to fly people to North Dakota, look at the space, look at what was there. And uh, we, we came back together, and David, the next slide, uh, we, we looked at renovating the existing space. And we were going to open that space in a late April, early June 2015 time frame. So, you know, uh, two weeks ago <laughs> was kind of, you know, our original target. And uh, if, you, if you go to the next slide, you'll, David, you'll see uh, this is what the facility looked like when, um, we went out to look at it. And it, it doesn't look bad. I mean, it, it looks really nice. Uh, but as you'll see in a few minutes, it, it doesn't look like sort of spreading you. 
and uh, we're we're very conscientious about our branding and um, and making sure that our look and feel is sort of you know the same across all of our footprints. So um, that was going to to push us out to the the May uh, June timeframe. And so David, if you leave that picture now and go on to the next slide, in late February of 2015, we started having discussions internally uh, about opening a temporary facility on the base. Um, this really came down to uh, we had we had been out there a couple of times. People out there knew we were coming. They had lost their previous financial services provider on base, so there was some hardship being presented to to the Air Force uh, folks out there. And we really wanted to be able to be responsive to that. And so we started looking at how we could do that. Uh, we, had, we had supported some things around the Super Bowl and uh, some, some various other activities in the community there that seemed to indicate that these people really wanted us to get there and get going. They were excited about service credit union coming to Grand Forks, and, and they wanted to go ahead and get started. So we started having those discussions internally, and it, it didn't take us very long, uh, if you go to the next slide, David, um, for us to make a decision based on all the parameters that we had in front of us in terms of what was already contracted with Rensis, uh, what it would take to do something with any other provider. There wasn't really any temporary space that we could use on the base. There was potentially a place in the, in the BX, the base exchange, where we could put a, a small storefront, but it was going to it was going to cost a lot of money to fit that space out for a temporary space. So we made the decision that we were going to declare a disaster in Grand Forks, North Dakota, and it was really the disaster was well we're not providing services yet. That that was our disaster, and uh, so we declared that disaster on March the third, twenty fifteen. And uh, David, if you'll go to the next slide, it, you'll see that the mobile recovery unit arrived at Grand Forks on Friday the 13th. Um, I'm thankful it wasn't any other kind of a disaster to have a Friday the 13th involved in it. But um, when the unit uh, was negotiated for on, on March the 3rd, right? so this was a, a different kind of disaster. This isn't a place where we were providing services already and we were looking to, to fill the gap as quickly as possible uh, and where we had existing infrastructure. This was a whole different uh, ball game, and uh, it, it meant a lot of things had to fall into place. They didn't have to fall into place in a place where you already had existing infrastructure and facilities in place. So. For instance, we had you know, we had no telecom uh, provider uh, that we were working with yet in, in Grand Forks. We had um, we had no local relationships. We had uh, it, was a, it was a completely different sort of scenario. And one of the things that we had was we hadn't ever had a uh, an on base presence in the United States. And the parameters around doing that are somewhat different than they are in Europe. And so. There were a lot of pieces that we had to go through with the military in order to get a temporary unit on base. Everything from uh, the unit itself and what it was going to look like, where it was going to be, how it was going to be situated, what the power requirements were going to be, what we were going to do about data, uh, security clearances for the service credit union personnel who were going to be there on a temporary basis doing setup, uh, security clearances for the uh, service credit union employees who were going to be there to to serve the branch on an ongoing basis, um, and uh, security clearances for the Rensis folks who were going to be delivering and, and participating in the setup of the unit. All of that had to be organized and coordinated and uh, with several different units uh, on the base. And so the U.S. military, the U.S. Air Force, actually chose this arrival day because they wanted to make sure that we weren't impeding the normal flow of traffic during the work week uh, in, to do our setup. 
So they wanted to get everybody kind of off base as much as they could uh, out of the BX parking lot area so that we could get the unit in, get it situated, and spend the weekend getting it, uh, getting it up and going. Um, David, the next slide uh, would show a picture of the unit uh, as it was originally deployed uh, at, uh, at Grand Forks um, on the 13th. Uh, and then there's a, a picture of the next picture is the unit uh, with branding on it. Uh, it's now open, proud to serve you. Uh, if we go on to the next slide, you'll see a couple of pictures of what the mobile recovery center looks like inside. There's a couple of service credit union uh, front office staff uh, in the top picture and uh, a front office staff person and one of my IT folks in the bottom picture uh, doing setups there at the teller station. If you go to the next slide, you can see a little bit of the, the data closet uh, area and the coin uh, and cash vault. That are that are configured in the unit as a as a banking recovery center, which is how this is configured. Uh, it's it's already got the functionality built into it to uh, to serve as a as a branch. The next slide. So IT staff and equipment all arrived at Grand Forks on Friday the 13th. My staff didn't want to travel on Friday the 13th, but they did. Um, we, we do contract for a, uh, a disk image to be kept uh, at Rensis, but in this particular case, we chose to configure units, since we had this 10-day window before the units were going to get there uh, from the time we declared, we actually set up the entire uh, workstation setup in our facilities in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, and then just pulled the hard drives out and had new units drop ship to Grand Forks, my staff picked up those units, just installed the hard drives in them, and they were up and running. So that, that made life a little easier from that perspective. Going to the next slide, front office staff arrived on Monday, March the 16th uh, in the afternoon. On Tuesday, March the 17th, the alarm was installed and cash was delivered. There are some things that sort of push your timeline around. If you're a financial institution, especially a retail financial institution, one of those things is the availability of cash. Um, you, you have to have certain parameters for cash deliveries. One of them has to be the alarm unit has to be working. Uh, the other is that whoever you use for your cash provisioning has to actually provide services on a particular day. In Grand Forks, North Dakota, the provider can deliver cash on Tuesday, and only on Tuesday. So that partially drove some of our timelines as well. Moving to the next slide, we opened for business on March the 18th. So again, sort of a five-day time frame from the time the unit arrived to the time we were open for business. A lot of the sort of permitting kind of stuff was the stuff that happened in that 10 days between the time we declared the disaster and the time that, uh, that the unit arrived. And a lot of those 10 days were spent with Rentis folks on the phone, coordinating with the folks from uh, the Air Force, the civil engineering section of the Air Force, um, the permitting section, the security section, trying to make sure that we had everything ready to go the way that it needed to. Uh, the next slide shows the front office staff and my two IT staff folks who, who went out and did the setup on the branch there. Uh, one of the things that uh, is worth mentioning is that uh, you know, I mentioned that we didn't have uh, telecom relationships. I, when I talked about uh, our recovery in Falmouth, one of the things that was really golden for us was that our, uh, our telecom facilities, our datacom facilities were not impacted, and we were able to extend those out to the trailer. And in this case, since we were going into a brand new area, we didn't have that. So uh, we, had, uh, we had some work to do that weekend. We had, since we had deployed uh, in Falmouth, we had also changed uh, our internal telephone system. We had never set one up on a remote. Uh, it was a complete voice over IP system. Uh, and so there were, some, there were some challenges there. We uh, made the decision to deploy uh, a dual uh, LTE connection um, from the trailer and, uh, and ran a VPN over that back to our home office. Uh, in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, and, uh, and, and that worked okay. 
but you know those guys had their had their work cut out for them, and they stayed through the opening and, and actually through the next weekend uh, just to make sure that the branch was you know supported in the way that they needed to be once they were up and running. And then if you go to the next slide, uh, David, um, we moved out of the mobile recovery center on uh, on May the fourth. Um, it turned out that the contractors who were doing the refurb on the existing uh, location were able to work a little more quickly. Uh, and there were a couple of you know, sort of contingency things we thought were going to need to be done that ended up not being needed to be done. So we ended up not in an early June time frame, but in an early May time frame for that facility to be ready. And so uh, on a weekend, we closed the business on Saturday. We moved everything Saturday afternoon, tuned it all up on Sunday, opened back up for business in the permanent facility on Monday, May the 4th. And, uh, and the next slide you'll see is uh, a picture of the facility as after it's been sort of service credit unioned um, and uh, has our, our look and feel, our, our carpet, our, uh, and, and all of our branding elements. Uh, that make it look like uh, any other service credit union branch. When we opened the branch there, we already had members, we had about 60 members who were already located on that base, people who had joined service credit union when they were stationed in Germany and who had uh, been moved to Grand Forks uh, over, the, over the years. And, uh, and so right away, we had uh, recognition of, oh yeah, this is service credit union, this is, this is what we remember. This is, uh, you know, the way that that we're used to service credit union looking, and and just a comfort factor for the for the membership there. Um, that uh, that's what I have. Those are, uh, and if you, you go to the next slide, David, it's, it's a question slide. Uh, like I said before, um, you know, I hope that you see the the sort of uh, different ways that these two uh, options. You know, came to be and and how they were utilized, uh, and and maybe it will spark some creative thinking about ways that you can use the facilities that you already have contracted, uh, or think about other things that you don't have contracted, but it might spark something that you think, hey, you know, if we had that uh, recovery piece, you know, we could do different things in our business than we do now, and so. Um, I, I just like to hope that you know maybe somebody will get some spark out of out of you know seeing the difference between these two and, and some thought about how you can use the things that you already have contracted to, uh, to to fulfill some business needs going forward. Thank you. That was great, and we've got some good questions. Um, first one: uh, Did your deployment timeline meet your expectations? Uh, I would say that in both cases, um, I think it was actually faster than we expected it to be. Um, I think we were a little frustrated with the town of Falmouth um, in terms of uh, the permitting. We felt like we could have been open a day earlier. But we were really impressed with the delivery time frames and the ability for the staff to get things up and running. Um, our staff and Rince's staff. Rince's uh, has a, a, you know, I, I'm a fan of the the guys who come out with the units and and help you get them set up. So um, we really felt like they were a great resource and helped bridge the knowledge that we had about our network and and our connectivity and our pieces and our business needs with. And here's the stuff that's in the trailer, you know, that's in the mobile recovery center. You know, they knew how those pieces worked. We knew how our pieces worked, and and it was a it was a good team to work with. Was the um was that timeline built into your your plan? Did you expect? I mean, not uh, the rents piece, I understand, but also things like the permitting uh, delay and so forth. There there really wasn't. No, uh, it was the it was the first time. Uh, really that we had the the Falmouth situation was the first time we had really been in that situation where we had had a branch uh, you know crisis uh, that we had to respond to uh, in this way you know where we had a branch that was closed we have you know we have temporary branch closures all the time we're in New England you know it snows and there's ice and you know so those things happen and um, and our expectation there is, you know, if a branch is going to be closed for a couple of days, it's no big deal. You know, they'll just announce that and, 
and mostly those are New Hampshire branches, and we can, you know, like I said, redirect people uh, to other facilities. But um, we we didn't really have uh, a good idea of exactly what the steps were going to be to get us from oh we're going to declare a disaster here to we're going to be open. And so I think for for a lot of the Falmouth situation, we were kind of groping in the dark. You know, it was a it was the first time for most of the people on the response team to be in that situation. So this this question just came in. This is a, this is great. Um, looking back at it, is there anything you could have done proactively to reduce the permitting time? I'm not sure that there could have been. Um, the people at the town actually were very anxious about the fact that they weren't able to issue the permit any sooner. Um, the people that we had to interface with directly um, in the town of Falmouth about the permit were people that were all members of ours. And so they had a very vested interest in it being open because they wanted to be able to do their own banking. Um, but you know, they had, their, they had their process that they had to go through, and they had to get a resource to go out and measure this and measure that and check it against code and do this, that, and the other thing. And, and we really, until the unit was there and, and we had deployed it, they couldn't come and say, yeah, it's okay, or no, it's not. Um, so I really don't, don't feel like there's much that we could have done different. We might have been able to do something different if the disaster had occurred on a different day. Um, if the disaster had occurred, let's say, on a Monday, then while the unit was rolling from Texas to, to Massachusetts on Tuesday, Wednesday, you know, we might have been able to get the, the guy from the town who was going to be able to issue the permit, the, the town engineer, to come out and, you know, give us direction about, well, put it here and, you know, I can go ahead and start the permit work. But in the case where we really, you know, the unit got there first thing Monday morning, uh, and, uh, you know, they didn't have anybody available to come look at it until Tuesday, and then it was Thursday before, or Wednesday late before they said, yeah, you know, we can go ahead and issue a permit. It's okay. So I don't really think there was much that we could do given the time frame, given the, the specific days when it happened. Okay. Fair enough. Ed, if I can piggyback on top of that, and Bill, sure. if you can clarify, because there's a difference if this was used as back office workspace versus front office workspace. So oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. in most cases, this unit is governed by the Department of Transportation, and it does not require permits. But because it was used as a retail branch, the front office, now that's a different set of rules. And so that's yep. what uh, Bill was dealing with. Yep. Yeah, it's a very valid point. Um, there's still a few good questions. I want to try and get through all of them. Uh, how, how large a staff could you support uh, in the mobile branch, and, and how many customers did you have the first day that you were open? I think we had something in the neighborhood of 15 members come in the first day. Uh, I, you know, they they didn't know we were open yet, uh, and so it really it was kind of a, you know, got to get them by. People were checking the website, that kind of thing. But I think we, I think we served only about 15 people that first day. Um, we, uh, we typically in the, I can say typically now because we've done some of them. Uh, <laughs> we we have uh, we we generally deploy two tellers, one back office person, and a management person uh, is is what we staff the the branch with uh, when it's a mobile branch. Okay, um, can you talk a little bit about your contingency plan for the U.S. based call center? Uh, actually, yeah, I can. Um, we have. So in 2012, we built a new headquarters building and relocated our contact center to be in that building. So they're actually in, in headquarters with all of the executive staff and most of the back office departments, with the exception of IT. Um, the, the executive offices uh, were in one building with some back office departments and with IT uh, a mile from the new facility. And the contact center was 25 miles up the road in Rochester, New Hampshire. We built the new facility. Uh, uh, most of the staff came out of the what is now called the operations center, and 
most of the staff, certainly all the contact center staff, came out of the Rochester facility, and all of those got uh, put together into the new headquarters building. But uh, we are right at the tail end of, uh, of, of a plan, uh, the implementation of a plan, that is refurbishing the old contact center space in Rochester uh, with uh, 45 hot units that um, staff could, uh, contact center staff could be deployed there in the event that the main contact center was unavailable. Um, we, our expectation is that it's unlikely that we would have a disaster that would affect our building that would also affect our link to Germany and the German contact center should remain open regardless. Um, we have not had uh, any opportunities to deal with a situation where neither of the contact centers was capable of, uh, of occupying their building and, and doing their job. Um, but we're, our expectation is that uh, with, the, with the backup contact center, the recovery contact center in Rochester, that we would be able to use that to support U.S. operations uh, in the event that uh, the headquarters building was unavailable. So that's our plan at this point. Okay, great. No, thank you. Um, well, yeah. So we did not get to all the questions, and for those that submitted questions and we didn't get to them, we'll, we'll get those to to, um, to you both, uh, Dave and Bill, and um, maybe you'll uh, send out the responses to those along with the mm -hmm. uh, the deck that goes out afterwards. So, so first off, thank you both. Uh, great presentation. Um, for information about the solutions that Rensys provides, you can visit rensys.com. And do remember to visit continuityhousing.com or leave a comment in the survey if you're interested in how they can provide your critical employees guaranteed housing when they need it most. And finally, uh, for those of you that do this regularly or not, uh, a very brief survey about this webinar is going to pop up when you close your browser. Please take half a minute to answer the questions. It really helps us uh, improve these presentations for you, drives the content, and so forth. For Dave Tedford, Bill Arnold, uh, Ron Burgundy, Continuity Housing, the Association of Contingency Planners. I'm Ed Goldberg. Thank you for joining us today, and have a great day and a productive week.